Hello, and welcome to the Jenkins Documentation Office Hours. Today is January 18th, and this is the EU US edition. Uh, today, uh, around the table, we have myself, Kevin Martins, Mark Waite, and Bruno Verachtin. Uh, if anyone uh, else joins up, welcome in, as always. For the agenda today, uh, we've got the Jenkins Contributor Summit uh, in FOSTEM in general, uh, Contributor Spotlight updates, the 2023 recap, uh, latest LTS to be published next week, GSOC 2024, uh, version documentation for Jenkins.io updates, uh, the sponsor adding sponsor page or sponsor attributions to the sponsors, uh, a small update to the Twitter link in the footer, integrating the Docker Compose uh, into Jenkins tutorials, which uh, great to have some movement on there. Uh, and the last thing I have on the agenda, if we get to it, we don't. If we don't, no big deal. Uh, but I want to start the discussion about having an upgrading Jenkins section in the documentation. Uh, and so again, we'll get to that. We'll discuss that when we get there. Uh, but until then, we'll go. We'll start from the top. So. Uh, first off, the Jenkins Contributor Summit. Again, FOSTEM is approaching. We're just a couple weeks away. So on February 2nd, the Friday before the FOSDEM conference, we're going to have a Jenkins Contributor Summit. And really exciting because uh, most of the team is going to be there. We have four out of five board. Uh, uh, we have uh, yeah, four out of five board members and uh, every all the officers uh, outside of Tim Jacone. We're not sure if they'll be able to get the funding for traveling there. Um, but Really exciting to have the full team there. We're going to have a great, we've got a really great plan for the Contributor Summit. John Mark Messen has been uh, publishing a couple of blog posts, one as of yesterday about the Contributor Summit, giving a quick rundown of what we're looking at, some details about where that's going to happen and what the plans are. Uh, and yeah, just really exciting times. Uh, I'm looking forward to meeting everyone and getting to share the documentation information with the rest of the Jenkins community. Um, and yeah, really looking forward to everyone being there. Next up, so on the Contributor Spotlight, last week we published Chris Stern's Spotlight. Thanks again to Chris for all of their work on the Contributor Spotlight and Jenkins in general. Uh, and Uli Hafner's Spotlight will be published next week. Uh, so we're ending the month strong and then we've got plenty to go after that. So uh, once we get back from FOSM, we'll continue that publication. Uh, the 2023 Jenkins Year in Review recap is still being compiled, compiled but once we have all those uh, entries put together, we'll get them submitted as a pull request, and uh, from there it shouldn't need too much editing, so hopefully we'll be publishing that soon. Uh, LTS 2.426.3 is set to be released next Wednesday, the, the 24th, so the change log and upgrade guide have been approved and merged already. Uh, the baseline, the next baseline that we're looking at is uh, right now the popular vote is 2.440. So that's looking really promising. Uh, we've got some great results from that and a lot of success there. So that's great news to hear. Uh, and then uh, weekly 2.441 released this past Tuesday successfully. And then next week we'll have 2.442 uh, to be released as well. Uh, next up on the agenda, Google Summer of Code 2024. So again, preparation has started. Uh, Chris Stern is the uh, Google Summer of Code admin for Jenkins this year. So really excited to have them uh, heading that up. Uh, we've got 10 mentors that have already volunteered. We can always get some more if there's interest there. Um, we've got the Call for Mentors blog post. We've got the uh, contributor session roundup online meetup that's going to be happening on the 24th or the 25th at this point. Um, I forget what the exact date is. Was it, uh, Bruno, do you happen to remember what the uh, the exact date is for the contributor session roundup? For some reason, I thought it was I the I think 25th. it's on the 25th okay. of January. Because I think that was the, I, I remember seeing the 25th, so that's that makes yeah. sense. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So uh, the contributor session roundup. So that's for any interested contributors that want to part that are looking to participate in Google Summer of Code, that meeting's for you. Uh, definitely attend if you want to contribute or if you want to uh, be a mentor, anyone can uh, participate in that. 
And the great thing is we've been seeing a lot of Gitter activity for the Google Summer of Code uh, Jenkins channel, which is fantastic. Uh, Chris has been responding to folks that are curious about it. I know uh, others have as well. Bruno has been in there. Uh, a lot of folks are just in here sharing their perspective and insights into Google Summer of Code, which is just fantastic to see. So uh, really happy to have that interest there and the community acting around it. Uh, for the version documentation for Jenkins.io, this is something that Chris Stern and Von Dietz Singh have been working on. We've been discussing for some time. Uh, we know that January is a bit busy for Von Dietz with exams. So uh, what the goal is for right now is to do heavy review for the version documentation site. Uh, we've got the, rep the repository positioned in infra. The issue has been created in the infra uh, for the infra team. Uh, Hervé Lemira is helping with preparing that. Uh, and what I'm currently doing right now is going through and reviewing the various sections for a lot of the navigation link functionality, uh, general uh, site working or just making sure the site's in working order. Um, I've been going through the installation docs and, and uh, that's leading to other places as well. So the good news is I found some things that I can create issues with and provide that guidance to Chris and Von Diet so that they'll be able to take care of those things. Um, so yeah, and like I said, uh, with Vandy being uh, busy with exams the month of January, we're looking at February that they'll be able to come back and start working on some of these things with the full uh, capacity that they wanted to be able to devote to it. Um, yeah, so uh, I think it's great that Vandy is taking some time to take, worry about himself, take care of exams, and then come back to this. That's great. And then, um, so uh, Mark, I was wondering if you might have any insight about the what's the policy for documentation versions. Um, I, I think it was a note that came up in the Asia Docs office hours last week, and I wanted to was wondering if there was anything more to that other than just what starting that conversation. Yeah. So well, so I think the question was prompted by, uh, will we do two dot four twenty six dot x as the version number and then 2.440 as the version number or will we do something different and, and for me the the take was i think we should do the LT, each lts baseline so 2.426.x mm -hmm. or call it 2.426.1 and and then 2.440. yeah then 2.440.x And and that way we've got, or or maybe 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 I should say it differently. Maybe we even just admit two dot four forty six four forty dot one. Don't use the dot x at all because it's a point in time snapshot, and because it's a point in time snapshot, it should probably have an explicit version number that exactly matches a Jenkins version. Uh, Bruno, an opinion there. Uh, in fact, the automat everything uh, guy in me uh, is. <laughs> Uh, prefers the 2.440.1 just because we could have a process of some sort um, mm -hmm. scrutinizing, uh, looking at the latest LTS version creation and then uh, creating a PR so that we know that we can have another version of the documentation, something like that. So, sorry, to make it short, uh, two point something point uh, something, which is not X, just a number is good for me. So, so uh, Kevin, I think I think that's a choice we get to make as the as the docs team and i think 2.426.1 is a good pattern let's mm -hmm. let's do a quick check open up git-scm.com git-scm.com oh, okay and in the documentation link that's there reference manual whoops mm -hmm. reference manual pick any one of those so config for instance Mm -hmm. Notice the drop down up at the top. So it's got 2.43.0. 2 uh -huh. And it seems, yeah, so it seems they are doing it by exact version number. Mm -hmm. So now I don't think we need to do or each and every version. Dot two and dot three. I, I really don't think yeah. we do. It is enough that we get a, a version every three months, right? That's already mm -hmm. already much better than we've got. Yeah. Right. 
And I feel as though unless something very drastic changes between that point one and the point two or point three, that it wouldn't be necessary to even call it out at that point. Well, and so. and and certainly there are changes between dot one, dot two, and dot three, but those changes are documented in the change log and in the upgrade guide. And and version documentation is about taking a snapshot of the entire set of documentations. You know, basically it's a snapshot of a book. Yeah, and uh, you two who have been working with LTS documentation for quite a long time, do you think it would be valuable to have a different version of the documentation for .2, .3, I don't think so. I don't think mm -hmm. there are that many changes in the documentation between the .1 and the .3 or .4, mm -hmm. or am I wrong? You're you're absolutely correct. If if we made those kind of dramatic changes between dot one, dot two, dot three, and dot four, it would be preceded by or accompanied by an entry in the upgrade guide and an entry in other places. This this naming pattern doesn't prevent us from using adding a dot two or a dot three if something really motivated it. But I, I don't see the benefit. Uh, what is the pattern of uh, users upgrading to latest versions of uh, um, an LTS, for example, the 2.426.1? Uh, do people upgrade? Um, do all people upgrade to the latest version when it gets out? Or do they keep with their uh, first version? And then, unless there is a security uh, issue, they then migrate to a newer version of that same LTS. Yeah, Sorry, so let's let's... There. Let's let Kevin answer it for us with a picture and a picture yeah. that will. So Kevin, open up plugins.jenkins.io, mm -hmm. search for Git client. So here's a, actually even better. Let's go one better. Search for structs, S-T-R-U-C-T-S, right? This is used in 98% of Jenkins instances. So it's a good sampling of total Jenkins instances. View detailed version information, Kevin. And now what you've got to do is shrink this thing, keep shrinking because we actually don't need to read the numbers. Okay. okay, now scroll to the right and all right, there we go. Now, if you'll scroll downward, what we see here, if you hover your text over the row that is over the rightmost column of the row that is the interesting LTS baseline, so LTS version. So scroll left to find mm -hmm. what that is. So okay. we want the one at the top of your screen. Let's look at 401.1. Oh, okay. okay. Go all the way to the right now. Yeah. Hover over that 4990. So this says 47% of plugin installs are in this core version or newer. So 47% of all the installs of, of, um, structs are on this. So of the 200 and almost 80,000, a hundred and what is that? 140,000, 130,000 are already on 2.401 or, or newer. So now Kevin, if you'll go down looking at 2.426, mm -hmm. so look at dot one there. And this one says one quarter have already upgraded. And now mind you, this data is only refreshed, if I recall correctly, monthly. Mm -hmm. And so there's a there's a delay period while people are upgrading. So this is a this is a very conservative presentation of of update of, of upgrade history of upgrade status. And we already see that half the users of this plugin are already on 2.401, and a quarter of them are already on the current baseline LTS. Okay. Uh, the question that motivated uh, the question I just asked was, would it make sense to have a global um, version for all the um, declination of the um, uh, current LTS? You know, just one big version for the dot one dot two dot three dot four because there aren't that many changes. So it would make sense to just squeeze everything together, right? Or not? I'm sorry, sorry I'm not I don't sure. think I made myself clear. Yeah. What what um, things are you envisioning squeezing together? Are you thinking that there would be change between 426. Dot, documentation changes between 426.1 and 426.3 that are important? If ever 
that was something that happens. Yes. Would it make sense to just keep the same version of the documentation and just modify it? And and I think we have that option, right? By by creating a tagged branch for 2.426.1, if we decided in some future day, whoa, there are enough changes in 2.426.3 to justify a new a new tag, a new placeholder on the version documentation, we could do that. Okay, because I don't know how the process works for the time being, but I'd like uh, to be able to do it if ever it was needed. You know, I wouldn't mm -hmm. like to be um, stuck with one version per LCS baseline and not being able to change it anyway. Okay, well, and, and that's a, that's actually a good hint. Kevin, why don't you take us to the version documentation preview site? Sure. Because let's see what he's currently got. Uh, actually, I think I might pull up because I have it running on my local uh, fork of it. I might just pull that up. And oh, it. oh, okay. Even better. Yeah. You, you okay. can look at a hot copy of the master branch. Yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. Let me just make sure. Yeah, this is okay. So this is everyone can see the this is the version documentation site. You yep. can see here in the bottom corner, there's our options. Okay, and, okay. and on the pick list for 2.426.x, what other choices are there? Uh, so there's user documentation, tutorial. No, sorry, no, or... on the blue bar, sort of bluish bar, yeah. is there a down arrow? Is there something on that down arrow that gives us a choice of something else? Uh, so there isn't right now. Um, I okay, think the so... way that they had that it had been set up previously is it had multiple version numbers under the solu like solutions page, for instance, and you could pick from which one was there. Uh huh. Like how the special interest groups, or um, like how these have latest, but uh, there would be two point four two six or two point four one three or what have you, aside from the two point four two six. Um, it looks like it's been removed in favor of working on latest. Uh, I don't know that for sure, um, but I know that there was previously multiple uh, versions listed here underneath mm -hmm. each header. Okay, so so that's a piece where I think we've got got to do some more exploring with with Van Diet's site because I was assuming there would be a pick list here that somehow mm -hmm. lets me choose whether I want four fourteen or four twenty six. Yeah, me too. And and yeah. obviously he chose two dot four twenty six dot x, maybe showing my bad influence. And and <laughs> I think it's easy for us to say, hey, dot one is is probably the better choice. Yeah. And I, I think that's an easy enough change. And I, I I agree that having the exact version is a little bit better for keeping everything aligned. But more so, I think it's if it's supposed to be a snapshot of that that LTS, that makes sense. And I think, like Bruno said, if something drastic or something were to happen between multiple versions that we need to include that documentation, we can add that later. We can have a separate version specifically, you know, for that. So mm -hmm. right, yeah. Yeah, and and just to uh, for as far as uh, Bruno's suggestion or, or question about um, having those versions uh, for the change log, from my experience, I haven't seen anything come through in the point two point three that's been so drastic that we've had to have like an emergency or uh, like really necessitate a huge documentation change or any additions or anything like that. So uh, yeah, it's definitely not common for that to come up. Um, if it does, though, this is this absolutely gives us that flexibility, like Mark was saying. Yeah, agreed. Uh, okay, let me get my stuff back. I just cleared my desktop. That's fun. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, so great. Thanks, Mark, very much for helping clarify that. And I think we have a great idea of moving forward what the next step would look like for there. Thank you. Thanks. Any other thoughts, comments, concerns about the version docs for now? Mm. Okay, great. Uh, so next up uh, on the agenda, so adding the sponsor attributions. Um, brief recap, uh, our friends at JFrog asked about being attributed to the downloads. We said, yeah, we'd love to ha make sure that you're attributed to the downloads, but you probably do more than that. So let's make, a, let's make sure everyone's uh, attributed properly as a sponsor. Uh, so, uh, thanks to some discussion with the governance board, uh, Basil Crow has taken it upon himself. He made a mock-up of the um, 
uh, sponsors page that we can potentially add to the site. It looks really great. Uh, it's still in draft right now, but we've been having the discussion. Uh, it's been ongoing about how to set it up, what kind of uh, levels we want to put to it. We've got this Olympic medal idea that makes a lot of sense and frankly works for what we're looking at with Anchor being the highest level of sponsorship, Mirror being something totally different from what that sponsorship, the regular sponsorship entails, and then gold, silver, and bronze accordingly. Um, not everyone's contributions are measured monetarily, but this is something that makes more sense in terms of like that impact that someone, that a sponsor has. So really great there. Um, still progress to be made. There's been some changes in the last month or so uh, with different sponsorships and coming and going. Um, so for instance, Red Hat is no longer part of the Continuous Delivery Foundation. So they're no, no longer a sponsor. They've been removed from uh, the Jenkins homepage, in fact, due to that. Um, so you can see they're no longer here. Uh, Oracle has not donated or Oracle stopped donating as well. Um, they're not mentioned there, so we didn't need to remove them, but still another thing to note. Uh, and DigitalOcean has been donated donated for both 2023 and uh, 2024, and they should be visible there, but are not. So uh, the sponsors page is a way for us to make sure that all of these sponsors are included uh, without having to cram everything in one smaller space and give everyone the proper like visual that they deserve, the proper um, opportunity to be seen. So uh, it's a great, great uh, endeavor. Uh, and yeah, more to come. Uh, quick note, since we're already down here, just uh, we updated the Twitter down here under community to be X formerly Twitter, just to stay up to date with their branding as well. Uh, we had a discussion in the advocacy outreach meeting and decided it was time for a change. Thanks to Hervé for including the little X logo here as well. That's a nice touch that um, I wasn't sure that we could do. So that's great. Um, but yeah. Uh, and then the, uh, so we've been talking about the Docker Compose being instituted or being integrated into the tutorials. Uh, so Bruno's taken it upon himself to do that and uh, create that. So the Maven tutorial has got Docker Compose integrated into it and that hasn't been merged. So it's now live on the site, which is great. Um, so we've got now in the Maven tutorial, we've got this uh, Docker Compose instruction here. The idea is that we're making this a lot easier and a lot more accessible for people to set up and use. Um, the Docker instructions are not necessarily uh, the easiest. And if something goes wrong, you have to then di diagnose and figure out what that is. So the idea of Docker Compose is taking that aspect away, making it simpler, making it easier, making it a little bit uh, more convenient to get started and get up and running. Uh, so again, thank you very much, Bruno, for do, taking on that work and doing that, contributing that and submitting that. Um, the Python tutorial revamp is the same idea. Uh, I've been able to review that from a documentation standpoint, just want to make sure that everything else is uh, good to go there. And if there's anything that um, you need to touch up or, or update or fix or anything like that prior to merge, that you have time to do that. Um, if that gets merged prior to Fossum, great. If not, it's okay, we'll figure that out. Uh, but um, everything looks great there too. We had discussed, uh, there was an interaction between, uh, a specific interaction between Python and Alpine that uh, Damien Deportel had mentioned, had brought up uh, recently. We went through the tutorials and uh, the documentation, Mark and I, and found that there weren't any instances where that's an issue. So uh, the Python tutorial should be okay in that regard. Um, there was some mention that it might not be up to date, but uh, again, Mark did some looking through there, found that it should be more than fine and adequate. Um, so everything should be okay there. Uh, so the long and short of it is the Pythor Python tutorial is also gonna get that Docker Compose integration, which is great. We just need to make sure that it's, uh, yeah, the final checks and reviews are ready to go. And then uh, that's all passing, we'll get it merged. Um, any other notes or comments to share on the Docker Compose stuff, Bruno? Or we've—I know we've been talking about it for some time. So, no, you covered it all. Thank you. But uh, thanks, Mark, and thanks, uh, Kevin, for taking the time to review it thoroughly. And the next tutorial should be about Node this time. It shouldn't be uh, groundbreaking. It follows the same pattern.
And uh, yeah, that's okay if it's not groundbreaking. The idea is that we're getting uh, better for everyone else by using Docker Compose and inc incorporating it. So that, and that's like, mm -hmm. you know, and it's uh, it's also the result of a Google Summer of Code 2023 project, it which is. I think fantastic. Uh, and this, uh, along with the version doc site, are just great examples of how GSOC is really beneficial to not only the participants, but the project itself. Um, everyone really wins in this. So it's great to have Google Summer of Code on firing on all cylinders. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, great. Thank you very much, Bruno. I really appreciate You're it. Welcome. And uh, thank you again for all the work. Thanks. Um, yeah. And uh, so the last thing on the agenda, uh, I think we'll keep it short just to start the topic and have this discussion in, you know, get going. Um, but uh, Vandit actually submitted uh, last year a pull request about adding an upgrading Jenkins section. Um, it hasn't been touched a lot since because there's a lot of nuance and specifics when it comes to upgrading Jenkins. It's very dependent on the user's installation process, what their environment looks like and set, and how it's set up, what kind of things they've got installed, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There are a lot of points where this could differ for everyone. Um, so it's a great idea. Upgrading Jenkins as a section should absolutely exist and that, that instruction should be there. Um, we just have to be very uh, cognizant and about how we approach it and how we're going to include this documentation, um, keeping these sort of things in mind and, and what other aspects are uh, maybe more important or more uh, crucial to the process than something like that. You know, if it's a matter of how they installed Jenkins, uh, what's the point in where we can have a unified set of instructions, for instance, um, because with the installation docs, we have uh, the various instructions for you know Docker, Windows, Mac OS, Linux, a, a bunch of other stuff. Uh, but at a certain point, they all turn into the same thing of unlocking Jenkins, logging in, setting up Jenkins itself. Um, so maybe there's a point in the upgrading process that we can find where it, it kind of does that same thing where these uh, various points all converge into one. And then uh, that would obviously make it a lot easier, but uh, yeah, I, and like there's probably nuances that I'm not even thinking of that could even come up after that point. So again, how do we consider those? How do we write this instruction so that it makes sense and covers those sort of bases? So I, again, I, we're running out of time for the meeting today, so I don't want to uh, necessarily get in a huge discussion. I want to respect everyone's time, but it's something to consider, and I I really appreciate. Uh, Vandit's idea. He's got a lot of good work there to get started from. It's a wonderful starting point. Um, but I think it's this is one of those things that comes with having just more and more and more and more experience with Jenkins, seeing how people are using it, being involved in the community. Like there's uh, more to it than a newer contributor might really get or have a concept for. So it's it's not the easiest thing. It's not the most difficult thing, but there are challenges lurking around the corner for all of it so great yeah i think this is something we can easily get done if uh the community can come together though uh, just going to take some time and some discussion and figuring it out so uh that's the end of the agenda that i had written up for us today uh, is there anything else anyone wanted to just mention discuss real quickly throw out there and if not that's great uh, that will bring us to the end of our session today. Thank you, as always. The recording will be available 24 to 48 hours. And until uh, next week, take care, stay safe, and we'll see you then. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay.